welcome to the second day of our meeting. Uh, now, uh, as, as many of you, or some of you may know, every year we hold a special lecture called the Hatter Award Lecture. This is named after the patron of the Hatter Cardiovascular Institute at the UCL, uh, Sir Morris Hatter. And this award always goes to uh, eminent individuals who have made a huge impact in their respective fields, be it cardiology, diabetes, or nephrology. And this year, we are really proud to uh, give the Hatter Award to an individual who fulfills all these values of the award, and that is Professor John McMurray. And I believe the best way to describe John um, is to uh, read from the plaque that we're about to give him. So, John, this is what it says. It says that if everybody can read that, the Hatter Award for 2022 is given to Professor John McMurray, MD, whose pioneering research in heart failure has made him one of the world's foremost academic cardiologists. He's starting to blush already. As an internationally recognized clinical investigator and authority in the field of heart failure, his work has made a significant difference to clinical practice and specifically to patients with heart failure. His globally acclaimed research work is widely published and attests to the impact that he's made on the lives of those at risk from heart failure. So John, a great pleasure to, to welcome you and we look forward to your presentation. So thank you very much, Derek. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, a bit shocked by this because I don't feel as though I deserve this and uh, certainly don't feel that I'm of the same calibre as the previous presenters, but I'll do my best and I hope I won't disappoint you. So it really is my honour and privilege to give this Hatter Award lecture and today I would like to talk about the pharmacological treatment of heart failure. So these are my disclosures. And I want to start by talking about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So patients with an enlarged, dilated, poorly contracting left ventricle, there's left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Conventionally, we've defined that as an ejection fraction of 40% or less. And I want you to remember that upper limit because I'm going to come back to it. So a few years ago, we thought we'd really reached the limits of what we could do pharmacologically for patients with this type of heart failure, conventional inotropes, increased mortality, would really push the limits of what we could do with the renin angiotensin system and with the sympathetic nervous system. And we tried to inhibit other neurohumeral systems that we thought were detrimental in heart failure, but in fact, those efforts had either been unsuccessful or even harmful. But we didn't give up entirely on the idea of modulating neurohumeral systems. And in fact, as it turned out, we've, we were able to enhance one of our endogenous beneficial neurohumeral systems. And that, of course, is the natriuretic peptide system. And we were able to increase natriuretic peptides by inhibiting their breakdown by blocking the enzyme responsible for the breakdown of natriuretic peptides, which, of course, is neprilysin. And the trial that we conducted to prove that neprilysin inhibition was beneficial was paradigm heart failure, which clearly showed that adding a neprilysin inhibitor to conventional therapy further reduced morbidity and mortality. Now, have we reached the limit of what we can do with enhancing, augmenting the natriuretic peptide system? Well, maybe not. Neprilysin inhibition actually leads to a rather modest increase in natriuretic peptide levels. And if we really wanted to stimulate this system, we'd probably be better to use a natriuretic peptide receptor agonist. And we are about to study one of those in patients with heart failure. And other approach we might use is to try and inhibit the breakdown of the intracellular second messenger that's increased by natriuretic peptides, cyclic GMP. This is broken down by one of a family of phosphodiesterase enzymes. In this case, PDE9 is the specific phosphodiesterase that breaks down natriuretic peptide stimulated cyclic GMP. Interestingly, the activity of this enzyme is increased in uh, the failing human heart and there are a number of PDE9 inhibitors 
uh, currently under investigation in heart failure. So we've maybe not yet reached the limits of what we can do with natriuretic peptides. But with neurohumoral modulating drugs, have we reached the limit of what we can do pharmacologically in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction? The answer is, I think, definitely not. And even just in the past two years, we've seen four large randomized morbidity mortality trials that have reported and that were positive. I'm not going to talk about all of these today because I've got a very tight uh, time limit, but I do want to specifically mention the two trials with SGLT2 inhibitors, two trials showing this large and consistent benefit, large and consistent reduction in morbidity and mortality. That's it, sorry, slide didn't advance. Uh, DAP EHF and Emperor reduced two different agents in this class. And because of that consistent and large benefit, these drugs have already been incorporated in the recent update of the ESC uh, heart failure guidelines and actually have the strongest recommendation that any treatment can get. In other words, a class one level A recommendation. And now we have uh, five distinct pharmacological approaches in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction that reduce mortality, reduce mortality. Of course, these are given in four pills because Sucubtril Valsartan contains two of those life-saving therapies. But what these new trials have also reminded us of, and, and I think this is one of the very important conceptual changes in the past couple of years, is that maybe we've been doing things too slowly. Maybe we've not been using these treatments as quickly as we should. Now, why do I say that? Well, the SGLT2 inhibitor trials were really striking in demonstrating that there was a benefit of therapy within one month of patients being randomized. This is DAPHF, the same is true in Emperor Reduced, and indeed the same is largely true for all the other pharmacological therapies we have for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And in the new guidelines, we've realized that this previous approach, this sort of vertical stepwise approach where you start one treatment, you titrate to the target dose before you add the second, and so on and so forth, is probably not the right way to do things because amongst other things, it clearly delays the introduction of life-saving treatments that act very quickly. And there, there are other issues about this as well. So, in fact, the emphasis both in our European guidelines and indeed this was reiterated in the new US guidelines published this weekend, is that we have to start to think about these treatments in a different way. We have to recognize that they are complementary therapies. They act through distinct pathophysiological pathways. Their mechanisms of action are completely independent and that they're additive. And really the goal has to be to implement as many of these treatments as quickly as possible. The order in which you do this doesn't matter, but speed does matter. And really, the new guideline is probably as important for these conceptual changes as it is for the new drugs that are included in it. And really, the emphasis on initiation of these life-saving therapies uh, over up titration of any individual therapy, and as I said, trying to do this as quickly as possible. Another thing I believe that these two new treatments that I've mentioned really have emphasized is that cardiologists have focused too much on the heart. They've forgotten that it's a patient who has heart failure, that heart failure is a systemic disease, and that the management, the holistic management of the patient has to recognize this. Our patients are often elderly. They often have many comorbidities, in part because heart failure causes some of these problems. And just to give you two examples of, of how these new drugs have really opened our eyes to this and, and made us appreciate the importance of trying to manage these comorbidities. Uh, of course, chronic kidney disease is extremely common in patients 
with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction between a third and a half of patients of chronic kidney disease. And both of the new treatments that I've mentioned to you, both neprilysin inhibition and of course SGLT2 inhibition, which you heard about yesterday, uh, both slow the uh, relentless decline in kidney function that characterizes heart failure. Our patients with heart failure have approximately two to three times the rate of decline in kidney function that would be expected for uh, a man or woman of the same age without heart failure. And we can slow this, and we all know how important that is because worsening kidney function is one of the most difficult things that we have to deal with uh, when we treat our patients with heart failure. In fact, often leads to withdrawal of life-saving therapies such as renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system blockers. And another good example of this, of course, is diabetes. It may not be obvious to everybody, but heart failure is one of the most diabetogenic states that we know of. It's more diabetogenic than, for example, obesity. And uh, many of our patients with heart failure have diabetes or will develop diabetes. And one of the fascinating things that we found, again, with both of these new therapies is that they also have metabolic effects. So this is the effect of neprilysin inhibition on haemoglobin A1c. You can see that there is a reduction in haemoglobin A1c, but maybe in, more importantly, there was a substantial almost 30% reduction in the risk of uh, needing new insulin therapy during follow-up in patients in paradigm heart failure who had diabetes. Now remember, of course, the decision to introduce insulin probably wasn't made by the cardiologist and certainly wasn't made with knowledge of which of the blinded treatments the patients had been assigned to. And again, I don't think any of us uh, need to be told how important it is, if possible, to avoid the introduction of insulin. And then maybe less surprising, in the DAPHF trial, we saw that SGLT2 inhibition reduces or delays the likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes. So these are patients with heart failure who didn't have diabetes at baseline. And you can see again this substantial reduction in the likelihood of developing new diabetes during follow-up. So important renal and metabolic and ciliary benefits of these new therapies. And of course, this is really to highlight the importance of what we're all here about for these two days, which is to discuss the overlap intersection uh, of, of all of these problems that we have to deal with. Now I want to come back to that 40% ejection fraction limit that I mentioned earlier. I said to you that all of those treatments that we've discussed have generally been indicated in people with an ejection fraction of 40% or less. But is that the right limit? Is that the right upper limit for use of these treatments? And we've begun to rethink that question recently. And for about five or six years, we have been defining patients with an ejection fraction in the range of approximately 40 to 50% as a distinct phenotype, for want of a better description. Originally, these patients were described as having heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction, but the new ESC guidelines have renamed this as heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, and that nomenclature has been uh, endorsed by the US guidelines just this weekend. And the reason this has happened is that we recognize that these patients in this ejection fraction range probably have more in common in terms of their clinical characteristics with patients with a clearly reduced ejection fraction than patients with a clearly normal ejection fraction. But actually the more important reason this change in taxonomy has occurred is because of this finding. So here you see three types of treatment, very familiar to all of you. Here you see ejection fraction across the x-axis at the bottom. So these are trials where we've enrolled patients uh, in, uh, with the full spectrum of left ventricular ejection fraction. This solid green line shows you a continuous hazard ratio. And you can see that this remains clearly below one, in other words, indicating benefit of therapy, even in patients with an ejection fraction that's clearly above 40%.
So we actually have evidence, albeit from retrospective analyses of our large trials, that those treatments that I've talked about are beneficial in patients uh, with an ejection fraction above 40%. And one of the other really big changes in the new ESC guidelines, and again endorsed by the US guidelines this weekend, is that there are now recommendations to use these neurohumeral treatments in patients with heart failure and mildly reduced ejection fraction. In fact, the US guidelines go a step further and they give an even uh, more, uh, an even stronger recommendation for SGLT2 inhibitors. Now that is because these guidelines were published after the Emperor Preserved trial presented, the ESC guidelines were prepared before this trial presented. This is the sister trial to Emperor Reduced using uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor in patients with an ejection fraction above 40% empagliflozin compared with placebo in these individuals. A very different patient population, much older, much more likely to be female, uh, a lot more comorbidity, and in fact, in these patients, half of them had chronic <coughs> kidney disease. And empagliflozin was beneficial. You can see here there was a reduction in the primary composite endpoint of 21%, mainly driven by reduction in heart failure hospitalisation. So even for patients with an ejection fraction above 40%, things have really changed dramatically in just the past two years. Before 2020, no recommended endorsed treatment for these patients. And now in 2022, we actually have regulatory approval for Sucubitril Valsartan in the US and some other countries. And we've got regulatory approval for empagliflozin in the US and in Europe. And the guidelines go even further still by recommending those other neurohumoral therapies such as mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and angiotensin receptor blockers. So this is where we've got to in 2022 in terms of the use of these different pharmacological treatments uh, with an interesting divergence between the ESC guidelines and the regulatory approvals because the regulatory approvals actually do not impose an upper ejection fraction limit on where we should stop using those treatments. And this is, the, I think, going to be the interesting question going forward. Is there really an upper limit beyond which none of these pharmacological treatments work? And even empagliflozin in this recent analysis done by the emperor investigators perhaps has some attenuation of benefit in people with a relatively normal ejection fraction. Now that's a single retrospective analysis. Uh, we need to find out if that really is the case and hopefully we will shortly because we have the DELIVER trial, that's the sister trial to DAP-HF with dapagliflozin. This is completed. We're going to get the results of this very shortly and we will present these uh, results at the upcoming European Society of Cardiology Congress. So I want to come to a close now and I want to turn to a different sort of limit. And that's a limit that's really self-imposed. It's in our minds probably rather than a real limit. And how many times have you heard colleagues or maybe even how many times have you thought yourself that this patient's too old or too frail to benefit from these treatments? And I just want to show you that most of those ideas that we have are probably false. So here's one example. Here's DAP-HF. This is the same sort of analysis I showed you before. The continuous hazard ratio shown here by a green line. This is the age spectrum across the bottom. The oldest patient in this trial was 96 years of age. And you can see that the hazard ratio here is clearly and consistently below one for all of these outcomes. And even if you don't think death and hospitalization matter to older people, we saw exactly the same thing for health-related quality of life. What about frailty? Really a very, very important and increasing problem that we all face on the wards. Here is an analysis looking at the effect 
of SGLT2 inhibition by frailty. This is frailty along the x-axis. Uh, this is a Rockwood frailty index. The higher the index, the more frail the patients are. And certainly there is no reduction in benefit uh, in more frail patients. But this is really fascinating. So this is a patient reported outcome. So these are questions that patients answer themselves. Uh, this is part of the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, which if you're a heart failure doctor, you've probably heard of. These are the questions that relate to physical and social activities. So you can read them down here, you know, visiting your friends or family, doing household chores. This is the response to treatment. If the score increases, that means there's an improvement in that aspect of health-related quality of life. And you can see that, in fact, the most frail patients had the greatest improvement in these aspects of health-related quality of life. And then perhaps even more surprisingly, here are the results of the Paragon heart failure trial. This is our sucubitral valsartan trial in patients with heart failure in preserved ejection fraction. And what we found here was a very strong statistical interaction. You don't normally get interaction p-values that are uh, quite as small as this. And what we saw was, in fact, that there was an interaction whereby the most frail patients actually seem to have the greatest benefit of sucubitral valsartan. And in terms of tolerability, both for age and frailty, we found no difference uh, in comparing the two treatment groups in older patients and in younger patients. So finally, what else are we likely to see? What limits might we push further in the next couple of years? Well, one of the big problems that I've already alluded to, of course, is renal function, but also hyperkalemia is another problem limiting the use, particularly of renin angiotensin aldosterone system inhibitors, and particularly mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. But there are new mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists around. One of these is venerinone, a so-called non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, believed to be less likely to cause renal dysfunction, less likely to cause hyperkalemia. This particular agent has already been studied in two very large uh, chronic kidney disease trial patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease showing an improvement in renal outcomes but also showing an improvement in cardiovascular outcomes and when these two trials were pooled it was clear that the major cardiovascular benefit is in reducing heart failure hospitalization. So this may be a way ahead, this may, may be a way of pushing some more limits in heart failure and currently we're conducting this very large trial with phenerinone in patients with heart failure and an ejection fraction of 40% or above and we're pushing the EGFR limit down to just 25 mils per minute, somewhere where I think most cardiologists at least would be afraid to go with a conventional mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. So we'll have the results of this trial in a couple of years. My last limit is the weight limit. Even our patients with heart failure in reduced ejection fraction are becoming more obese. That is a particular problem in patients with heart failure in preserved ejection fraction. Again, an example of how these comorbidities are important and in themselves a target for therapy. And already there are two modest sized trials using some of the new weight loss therapies that we have available in these patients. So I've reached my time limit, and uh, for that reason, I have to summarize and conclude. So I hope I've managed to get across in this very short period of time, and by the way, not covering lots of things that I could have talked about, uh, the really amazing developments that have been in heart failure, even just in the past couple of years. And I think I've given you a pointer to where we may see more developments in the future. But what we must also, I think, take away today is that maybe the biggest limitation here in terms of whether our patients benefit is the fact that these treatments that we have available, wonderful treatments, 
uh, are, are not implemented, not utilised as much as they should be. And really one of the targets for the future is trying to improve implementation. Thank you very much.